All right. I'm going to teach. <laughs> Come on, teach away, Mr. Brown. That's going to be in our YouTube video now. I'm uh, a teacher for a long time. <laughs> Come on, teach. Uh, so, so I said last, the two weeks ago now, that I wanted to do like a book of the Bible. And so I picked the book of Matthew. I changed my mind three or four times, and so we're gonna we're gonna do the book of Matthew. Oh, um, full full disclosure: there's like not a chance that we're gonna get through the entire book of Matthew before I change gears and decide I want to do something else one of these days. So because I, we will be lucky if we get through the first verse today of Matthew. They're just, they're just they're good. So I don't know. I, sometimes it's very rarely that I do this because I don't preach sermons this way, but just doing kind of slow steps through Scripture, taking it like a verse at a time, word at a time, breaking it down really slowly. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, let me let me kind of start, I guess, by explaining why why I chose Matthew. Um, I've kind of been on this kick recently uh, where you guys know, like, apologetics and stuff. Like, we, we make arguments for God, and you, you have the cosmological argument and the ontological argument and all this stuff that people way smarter than me came up with and I can never remember because... Um, more and more recently, I've kind of come to this point that as good as those things are, I, I've come to adopt a more, what I'm going to call, like, Jesus-centric apologetic. So th this hit my sermon two, two weeks ago. I was talking about uh, why do I believe the Bible is true? Um, and there's a lot of apologetics out there about, like, why do we believe the Bible is true? You, you could talk about, like, fulfilled prophecy, the, the multiple authorship of the Bible, uh, accuracy of of manuscripts, just tons of discussion points, but uh, kind of what I came to is like the ultimate reason I, I believe this to be true is because Jesus believed it to be true, right? Like yeah. like Jesus believed the Old Testament to be the divine word of God. When he read it, he said, hey, you know, the, the law of the prophets and the Psalms, the entire Old Testament is, is about me. And so I, I think there's a reality there that says, if you really want me to explain why I believe this to be true, Jesus believed true and I believe what Jesus believed like it's, it's kind of that simple you can add in all the other stuff and that's great and I think the same kind of goes for like why, why do I believe God exists you know, there's great arguments out there but, but ultimately I believe God exists because Jesus is evidence of that and not just as like Jesus is evidence but you know you can have scholars and philosophers debate all day long whether or not God exists and they'll give you whatever arguments they want to give you no one in their right mind is going to debate on if Jesus didn't exist. Like, there's too much historical evidence. We know Jesus existed. Um, and so, I believe Jesus existed. I believe there's something about him unlike any other person that's ever walked this earth. And so I believe that if he believes God is real, and not only does Jesus believe God is real, but believes that he is God incarnate in flesh, then I, I believe in God. So, uh, I've been kind of developing this idea of this Jesus-centric apologetics but, but also Jesus-centric lifestyle. Um, so, so trying to really, really identify how is it that Jesus lived his life and then just connect that up with how is it that I live my life. Um, because there are very practical things that Jesus did that I'll be honest with you, like, I just don't do. Um, and anytime that Jesus does something and I don't do it, like, I need to ask, why, why is that? And usually it's because there's a fault within me, or there's something that I'm not seeing the world rightly. Uh, so, so example, i got to be careful with this, because sometimes this comes across as like hippie Jesus, right? <laughs> but like, have you read the Gospels? Like, sometimes Jesus comes across as like hippie Jesus in, in the Gospels. And I think that's very intentional, because he's challenging these notions of like, the, 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 Value of life is determined by how busy you are, or how much you accomplish, or how well known your name is. And Jesus comes in and essentially says, the value of life is getting away from everything and spending time with the Father. The, the value of life is going up on a mountain and praying. Like, it's there. Like, that's, that's what Jesus does. And so there's multiple times in the Gospels that Jesus will break away from the crowds and break away from his own disciples. And he'll go spend a day in prayer and just... Silence and solitude, him, him alone with, with God the Father. And I was thinking, like, when's the last time like I just got away from everything, the church, people, and just went and spent time with God? Like, I don't even know if I had a date on that. <laughs> like, do you guys have you guys done that? And I'm not like asking that accusatorily by any means. I, I just like I think the best case scenario is, and it's been forever, but 
if you go on a retreat, yeah. a church retreat, and you're really with a group, but right. they encourage moments of going along, and but that's not exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's tied in, mm -hmm. you know, but... Emmaus. It, and I'm, yeah, I'm just thinking, like, yeah. why, why don't we practice stuff like that as, as people that claim to follow Jesus, which... I want to follow Jesus. This was my sermon last week. Like, I want to be like Jesus. Being like Jesus it doesn't just mean that, like, I prioritize coming to church. I think there's still an element of, like, doing the basic discipleship things that we should do. But but the Bible, does, Jesus does a bunch of other stuff. And so, you know, silent solitude, fasting. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other things. There's a thousand things, but... With a carpenter, there you go. You know, go make something out of wood. I, I, I don't know. I beat the crap out of a piece of wood. <laughs> <laughs> but but like I do think there's there's something too like going out and creating. Like there's there's something too, you know, when you finish a project, Jim, and you get done with it, like there's an accomplishment there. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you have that etched inside who you are? I think it's because that is being made in the image of God. God. That God creates and enjoys His creation. Mm -hmm. And thereby, in the image of God, we can create and enjoy our creation. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to sound hippie, and I hope I don't. I just think, read the Gospels and let the Gospel speak. So, all that to say, like, um, I've been trying to just read through Matthew in my own time, in my own rights, and try to get a, a grasp on some of this stuff. And my hope is, like, this fall, we'll probably do, like, a series here, is where I'll start it, that will be like, well, let's, let's do a night that we talk about silence and solitude. Let's do a night that we talk about fasting. Let's do just these very practical things. But before we get to that, I thought, let's at least just start with the book of Matthew, see where we go from from there. So yeah, is that there, there's my wrong, long story. Also, because my phone is recording, I always need help with someone else keeping track of time. So, because um, I don't ever wear a watch, because I'm a millennial. I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, what time is it right now? 6.35. 6.35. All right, so I got, I got an hour, so we're good. We got plenty of time. Okay, so here's what I want to do tonight. Uh, I, I want to start off just kind of giving a generic overview of the book of Matthew, start to finish. How is it laid out? What's it about? Why is it important? Why do we read it? All that good stuff. Then we'll probably dive in a little bit to the first verse. And I, I think if we have enough time, we can at least get into the first part of the genealogy, because who doesn't love just reading lists of names, right? Uh, so, so this is the book of Matthew. By the way, uh, again, credit, excuse me, credit where credit's due. Uh, this, this whole little thing I'm about to draw up here and use and talk about uh, this is taken from the Bible Project, and their uh, kind of work through, they, they have overviews of the book in the Bible, so it's absolutely stolen, therefore people cannot accuse me of plagiarism now if I gave them credit, so, but it's really good, really good stuff. So, let's let's start off with Matthew. Matthew is the first of what we call the Gospels, and, and what are the Gospels? Matthew, oh, okay, yes, that's the... What, what? The good, yeah. So, so again, we're talking about the gospel. <laughs> I was like, yes, I know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, yeah, sorry. This is where I need to specify my questions better. Yeah, that's that's on me. I get it. So, so gospel is is the Greek word euangelion. U is uh, you know, it's the Greek prefix good. Uh, here, we'll, we'll start writing on the board. Um, Elion. I always like to write in Greek so I can prove to you guys I know it. But I don't know it that well. What does Ruach mean? Ruach is spirit in Hebrew. That's not Greek though. Uh, why did you ask that? I don't know why it's always been stuck in my head after you said it like twice. Twice? Oh, that's Hebrew for, for spirit. Somebody's listening. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so you is... Uh, that's that's the prefix good. We still use this in English, right? You, eulogy. So so you is good. Logi or logos is the Greek word for word. A good word. If you're going to give a eulogy about someone, you give a good word about them. That's what eulogy means. Um, uh, angelion is from the word angelos. Uh, sometimes it's translated angel, but the, the direct translation, anybody know? Well, what are angels sent to do? Messenger. Yeah, angels are the messengers of God. This is so. When an angel appears to Mary, what's the angel doing? Yes. <coughs> it's giving her a message. Yeah. So, so Evangelion is is good message or, or good news. Um, it's not. It's not an inherently biblical term, right? And, and we I've talked about this before. 
But this is a term that the Bible adopts from the world around them. And so if Emperor Augustine has conquered uh, another country and you now have access to their imports and resources because you've overtaken them and you've declared it for the empire of Rome, then they're going to send out uh, a little news blurb and they're going to have heralds go into all the city and the heralds are going to announce the what? The Evangelion of Augustus. Let me tell you what our Emperor Augustus have, has done for us. So the Gospels come in, the Gospel writers, and they take this word. And they say, you want to hear about what's really good news? Let me tell you the good news of Jesus, who, who has already declared the entire world his, and that he is king of the world and has conquered not just the world, but sin and death. And yeah, this is, so here's the good message of Jesus. And so what's this good message going to entail? Generically, we'll, we'll talk specifically more here in a little bit, but what's, what's the good message going to entail? You're going to talk about Jesus? Yeah. yeah. To, to save the world. Grace. He's going to save the world by bringing grace and the forgiveness of sins and, and redeeming humanity and, and restoring us to a right relationship with God. There's, there's all of this at play in this gospel. And so how, how are these, these gospel writers going to argue this? Well, they're going to connect it all the way back to the Old Testament over and over and over again because the, these gospel writers, right, they are very entrenched in the Old Testament themselves. Many of them, maybe not Luke, but all the rest of them grew up Jewish. So they're just going to start drawing all these connections for you. So guess what Matthew's doing right off the bat in his gospel? He's, he's quoting the Old Testament over and over and over again. So, so when we're talking about Matthew's gospel, what were a couple of things to look for? Um, look, look for Old Testament references. Uh, these are all over the place, but, but they're particularly like all over the place at the very beginning of the gospel, and they're all over the place at the very end of the gospel. He is very intentionally drawing the birth of Jesus into the Old Testament and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus into the Old Testament. And he's saying, this is, this is what everything's been leading up to, guys. Uh, the weird thing is, though, and we'll talk about this, it won't be this week, probably be next week, I don't know, we'll figure it out. But he, he draws some really weird stuff. Because he'll say things like, uh, in the beginning, uh, for as it was written out of Egypt, I called my son. And it's from uh, Hosea, right? And, and Hosea is, I think sometimes when we think about biblical prophecy, we imagine that like Hosea had this like, little movie screen. And he had to like watch the movie of Joseph and Mary like running down to Egypt and running away. But if you go back and read Hosea, do you know what Hosea is talking about? He's talking about the Exodus story. Mm, yeah. Hosea is doing reflection, not prophecy, and Matthew's coming in and saying, no, he's doing prophecy. And we're like, well, which one is it? And the Bible says, yes. <laughs> Here it is. This is what we're doing. Um, and, and then he's going to go on and say, uh, or as it was written in the prophets, uh, that, that the Messiah would come from Nazareth. And if you go and do an Old Testament search for the name Nazareth in the Old Testament, guess how many times you find the name Nazareth? Not a single time. It's not in the Old Testament. It was a town that was only about 150 years in existence by the time Jesus is born. And so is Matthew just lying? I don't think so. But I don't want to talk about that right now. There's tons of stuff in this. But I'm kidding. Long story short, Nazareth is a reference that means stick in, in, in Isaiah, right? Isaiah is talking about the shoot that comes from Jesse, the stick that comes out of Jesse. And I think Matthew's tying those two things together. That like Isaiah predicts it to be... Uh, stick man from Stickville. Jesus is from the sticks, right? From Nazareth. And where, yeah. That's a very short, we'll talk about it more in a few weeks. So so there's there's all these key Old Testament references, and Matthew's expecting us to be able to go back and pick up on it. Um, the other thing I would I would say here is look look for um, who accepts Jesus. And you already know the answer to this. Who are the people in Matthew's gospel that are going to accept Jesus as the Messiah? What are the categories of people that will accept Jesus as Messiah? Jews. Oh, Jews, Jewish people, of course. But but what about like the Pharisees and stuff? People who are not very well off. People who, yeah. It's, it's your irreligious. Irreligious. And, and you're like just... Folks. You're, you're, yeah, you're outcast, playing folks. Outcasts. You're out, I like outcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Outcasts, riffraff, works. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you follow through the book of Matthew, Matthew's going to tell you story after story of where lepers follow Jesus and Roman centurions follow Jesus. And it's these people that are totally outcast from like the Pharisee party. Why would Matthew focus this? What was Matthew's occupation? Tax He's a tax collector. Guess where tax collectors fall into that category? He's a car salesman. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, right? So, so this is Matthew coming in and saying, like, these are the type of people that Jesus is calling to himself. And what's he asking us to do as readers? To humble ourselves, lay aside our pride, and follow Jesus. Like, all, all throughout it. The other thing I'll say just kind of in, in general about Matthew is Matthew gives very little commentary. So that's like as opposed to uh, John, who, who John's going to continually give commentary. You know, if you go and read John 13, John is, is giving the story of Jesus like, washing the disciples' feet, and then John will break away and say, Jesus did this because, and give some commentary about it. Matthew doesn't do that. Matthew's just like, here's the story, here's what Jesus taught, figure it out. <laughs> like that's, Matthew's expecting you to go back, think about it, and connect the Old Testament to the New Testament to, to us today. So it means you got to do a little bit of legwork at, at times. A so bit of meditation. you got to do a little bit of meditation. And guess what Psalm 1 says? Let's say it again. Yeah, exactly. So meditate on it. So Any questions? I know I'm talking a lot about all, all of this. Are you bored yet? Okay, good deal. If you are bored, you'll just have to nerd out with me a little bit longer. It'll be okay. You only got like 45 more minutes. Okay, um, so, so Matthew... Is written thirty to forty years after the start of at or the start of the church. So, uh, so Acts chapter two is Pentecost, start of the church. Uh, Book of Matthew starts circulating about thirty forty years after that. Why does it take Matthew so long? I mean, why would he not just write it down right right from the start? Because he was preaching it in person. Because you had everyone there, like. How, how often are we going to write down stories that we tell each other? No, you write down your stories when you come to the realization of, oh, the people that know these stories are fading out. We should write. You guys may have even done this in your own families. I, I know we've done this with like Haley's granddad. Um, there was a point when Haley's granddad was starting to, to get sick, and we knew that he was going downhill. And so um, we all sat around a table one night, and they just recorded stories. Like, hey, tell a story. Of course, they didn't have recording devices back, back then. So... <laughs> Matt, they're 30, 40 years after this. What's been happening to a lot of these disciples? They're being martyred. They're being killed. And they're being killed quickly at this point. Mm -hmm. Nero comes to power. Domitian comes to power. Uh, it's not just Jews persecuting the Christians anymore. It's the Roman Empire as a whole persecuting Christians. And so they take a look around and think, we got to get this started to write down. So um, you get four accounts, and there's, there's more to all that. So Matthew's writing his gospel. And what he's doing is he's taking all these teachings of Jesus, the, these oral traditions, these stories that he's walked through and other disciples have walked through, and he's putting it all together in one unified story. Now, the tendency that we like to do, if we're going to write a biography, how do we write a biography? Start to finish. Mm -hmm. it, it's very linear. It's very, uh, I was born in 19, what, you know, you, you give it a start, here's the next event, here's the next event, here's the next event, the end. Uh, this is not how the gospel authors write. Um, it, it's a different type of rhetoric. It's a different type of time. It's a different type of literature. So what he's going to do is he's going to organize his gospel in a particular way to, pr to, to prove particular points. And he's got three, three key things that are going to come out right, right in the first chapter. Um, that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of, of David, right? So Messiah from, I can't spell, man, I write too fast. <laughs> Messiah from the line of David. And we, we talked about this last Sunday extensively, so I won't go too long. But uh, this, this term Messiah, right? it's the Hebrew term, me Meshiach. Uh, what's the Greek word for it? It starts with a C. You know it. Christ. Yeah. The Greek term for Messiah is Christ. I, I said this, and I'll just keep pounding on it because I think it's important. Christ is not Jesus' last name. He was not born to Mary and Joseph Christ. Christ is a title. So, so it's, it's from the Hebrew Messiah. And this idea of Messiah is that God would raise up an anointed one that would prove his purpose, that would be offered to redeem the world. It's, it's all through the Old Testament. I don't have the time to go and focus on it, but I mean, it's just like all over the place. 
So the New Testament adopts this mentality and this ideas. It just changes Messiah to Christ. But all the New Testament authors are going to continue to, you know, Matthew 1. This is the gospel or the, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who was born of David. <laughs> right? So, so he, he's tying in there. Um, and he's also going to say, um, born of Abraham. We'll talk about that later. That's a little smaller part. Second main thing is that, um, that Jesus is going to be the Messiah from the line of David, but he's going to be a teacher in, in the way of Moses. So, so what's the significant thing that Moses does? Do this over here. Here, I won't just, I'll just tell you. It'll, it'll make it easier, right? Annihilates a golden calf. <laughs> he annihilates a golden yeah. calf. Fair enough, yeah. I don't know if the golden calf's analogy or, or a parallel is there, but maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so, so Moses rescues the Israelites out of Egypt. Egypt. And one of the first things that Matthew's going to talk about is Jesus, Mary and Joseph, with Jesus as an infant, having to retreat to and then come out of Egypt. Egypt. Mm -hmm. So, so we're seeing a parallel here that both of these people come out of Egypt, right? Um, once, once they're on their way out of Egypt, and again, I'm, I'm drawing some really broad lines here, but I want to do that intentionally. Uh, what does Moses do on his way out of Egypt? Him and the Israelites. Before, before they wander in the desert. That is key. We're going to come back to that. I mean, they did their houses with the blood. Yeah, so to do the, house, the, the Passover, that's going to be a really key theme in the last part of Matthew. Uh, then after the Passover, where, what do they do? They go. They go. Yeah. Yeah. They, leave. Yeah. They, they get out of Egypt, right? And there's this whole big story. As they're walking out of Egypt, Pharaoh starts chasing them. They come to the Red Sea, and they're trapped, and it's the end of the story, right? No, no God rescues them by passing through water, right? So, so there's this passing through water. What does what does Jesus do before he starts his forty days and forty nights in the wilderness? Yeah, he's baptized. He goes and get baptized mm -hmm. in, in water. And there's a whole other connection here too about once Israel as a whole um, get or is leaving the wilderness, where do they pass through this time? The, the Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just but and then Jesus does the same thing. There's, there's all of these connections. I mean, Matthew is very intentional about drawing drawing these connections, and he's wanting you to pick up on it. But but both pass through the water, and then right, right after the water, what, what do they do, Micah? Oh, that's when they wandered in the desert. There, there's a wilderness wandering. How, how long for Israel? For Forty, 40 years. years. Forty years. How long for Jesus? Forty days. Forty days. Mm -hmm. like, come on, it's not just a chance, right? Like. It's not a coincidence. God is lining up something. And, and then, as soon as they get out of wandering in the wilderness, and for Moses, as he's kind of wandering in the wilderness, uh, they end up at a mountain, right? Moses ends up at Mount Sinai. And what does Moses do at Mount Sinai? Visits with God and comes back down with a set of instructions. Mm -hmm. What does Jesus do right after he's baptized and spends his time in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 5? He preaches a particular sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. Mount. <laughs> Right? Like, and what does Jesus do with the Sermon on the Mount? He gives instructions. Like, it's exactly the Sermon on the Mount. And what are all of these instructions based on? What Jesus is, our, what Moses gives from Mount Sinai. Like, you've heard it said, love your neighbor. But I tell you, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, do, do you see all these parallels at this point? Like, Matthew is, is so clearly just, just lining all of this up. So so like we can call this a mountain teaching. So all all of this is, is at play. And and what's what's the key actions of, of all of this? What what are the key things that Moses does? He is the deliverer. Mm -hmm. That he, he delivers Israel from <clears throat> Bond. Slavery. Yeah. yeah. What does Jesus do? Delivers, Delivers. from, from, from slavery to sin. Yeah. 
you know, there, there's deliverance and there's divine teachings. And, and each of them starts a thing called a covenant, right? Moses says, here's the covenant. And then Jesus comes in and says, here's the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a better Moses, is a greater Moses, is a more fulfilled and intentional Moses, is a more perfect, because he's totally perfect. Do you, do you see all the parallels mm -hmm. with, with all of this? So I, I give you all of that just to kind of get us, get us started. The third thing over here um, is he's going to continually emphasize this word we call Emmanuel. You guys know what Emmanuel means? God's God with us. us. You know that yeah. one? It's Hebrew, Imanu, which means with us. El is one of the Hebrew words for God. So God with us, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so what is Matthew going to talk about all through this book? How is God with us? Mm -hmm. And the question is, like, is it God, Yahweh, with us? Or is it God, Emmanuel, God with us, with us? And Matthew's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the story. This is what I want you to start. you seeing all this stuff drawn out of it. Any questions? I know I'm going like a million miles an hour here. All right, let's talk, let's talk breakdown a little bit, because there's still a couple more things I want to point out to you, and then we'll actually start into Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. So, uh, Matthew, if, we're, if we break it down, I think the way Matthew intends us to break it down, uh, you start off with, you have an introduction kind of point, this is chapters 1 through 3, um, and there's going to be a conclusion down here, and this is chapters, and again, I stole this from the Bible Project, they, they draw it much better than I did. Um, this is 26 through 28. It's going to kind of be their conclusion chapters. And in the middle, he's going to have five five chunks. Honestly, it would be better if I drew it in the middle first, and then I could actually build it out where it's like even. <laughs> um, he's going to have five five chunks of, of stories. So he's going to tell these stories. Um, and then after he's telling these stories, he's going to come in and he's going to show Jesus giving some sort of teaching over these stories, or Jesus is going to give parables about these stories, or he's going to give commentary. So Matthew himself is very rarely giving commentary, but he's going to give, show Jesus giving, giving commentary about these things. And I just realized, like, I had more detailed um, notes, because I just took pictures on my phone. But my phone's there. So. <laughs> it's all right. You, you just won't get, get the full, full, full part of it. Uh, so, so we start off four, four through seven. Um, and this is Sermon on the Mount, right? It's five through seven. But, but this is Jesus talking about the, the kingdom of God has come. Jesus is announcing the kingdom, right? And what, what does it mean that this kingdom has come? I'm not looking for any particular it's, answers. I'm just... It's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Okay, there's, there's fulfillment of the Old Testament that's come, yeah. What's Jesus coming to do? He's going to confront evil, right? He's going to wipe out the Romans. He's going to wipe out the Romans. It's Rambo Jesus. No, he doesn't do that. That's another part of Matthew. That, that's a key part, yeah. He's going to confront evil. He's going to restore God's reign over the world. All of this is about, he's going to bring a new way to live for people that would put their faith in him. And so this is chapter 4. He goes, he overcomes evil through, through his own wilderness wandering. So where every single person before him has failed, uh, where, where Abraham and David and everyone has failed, Jesus succeeds. He, he stands up for righteousness. He, he stands up for faith in, in the Father and conquers evil. And then he announces, right, I've conquered evil. You can come follow me. So then he's going to give this whole teaching about what following him looks like. And, and you get the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount's crazy, guys. Like, I was thinking about that. We talked about this at Sunday school on, on Sunday. Uh, I didn't talk about it in my sermon. But, like, Sermon on the Mount's weird. Because Jesus is not idealistic on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's not like he's saying, come follow me and you'll never have any problems and things will go away. And you don't have to worry about anything. Instead, he's like, when you follow me, and there's all these assumptions he's made. He, like, he assumes that you're going to struggle with lust. And let me tell you how you can fix that. And he assumes that... You're going to have conflict with other people. And let me tell you how to deal with that conflict. And he, he's assuming the messiness of life. And he's saying, but if someone's a follower of me, 
and they're going to live this way, right? It's going to it's going to change that a, a little bit. So he deals the Sermon on the Mount. Then after the Sermon on the Mount, we get all of these stories of of bringing this kingdom to particular people. So this is like chapter eight through ten. This is where I wish I had my, my notes, but there's there's actually nine little stories here. Um, they're all really close together in proximity, um, and these are just the different stories of Jesus interacting with people. Any guesses as to what kind of stories are in this section? The well, what is it? Oh, uh, what's your name? That's John. That's John. John. It's close. Yeah, I mean, it's very similar stories to that. Yeah, you can also cheat and go to your Bible. Yeah. <laughs> the wages where one worker comes and he starts it okay. in the morning and gets... So that's probably a parable. So those are actually a little parable. bit later. Oh, they... So this is Jesus directly interacting with, with people. So, the uh, wine at the wedding? That's John. <laughs> John <too. laughs> okay. This is what I'm doing. I'm just asking questions off the whim. And I'm asking questions that I honestly can't give all these nine answers to either. It starts with the lepers. Right? Mm -hmm. so Jesus heals a leper. Right? Mm -hmm. So what's he doing? He's bringing the kingdom of God to this leper, which, which is restoration, the overcoming of evil and sin, and the destruction of sin on humanity. Which, what does the destruction of sin on humanity look like? Sometimes it looks like disease and illness. And Jesus, right? These miracles that Jesus comes and performs, uh, this is like Lewis made this point and a couple other people before him. But when Jesus does miracles, it's not exceptions to the natural order, it's restoration to the natural order. Mm -hmm. Because when God creates humanity, in Genesis 1, he creates humanity perfect. We weren't made to get sick. We weren't made to deal with this. So Jesus isn't like going outside the natural order. He's coming in and showing, let me show you what the natural order actually looks like. And he heals people, right? Um, so he's going to heal uh, lepers, and he's going to encounter centurions, and centurion's son, right, that, that mm -hmm. dies, and... Um, the centurion comes to Jesus. He has these mm -hmm. stories. Uh, there's stories where he calms waves because uh, his disciples are really afraid and they're on a boat. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to restore order to them. It's just constantly Jesus coming in and, and restoring order and, and showing all these people what it looks like when his kingdom comes. And, and in between, you have nine stories. In between each kind of section of three, Jesus is going to give a little speech and he's going to give this command in his speech that is, follow me. Right? So why does Jesus say that? It's not like Jesus has come just handing out trick-or-treating candy bags. Like, you say trick-or-treat? You want some Skittles? You want to get healed? You know, Jesus is saying, like, what I'm offering here is a new way to live life. I don't want you just to follow me because you get healed or get food. or I want you to follow me because you see what the kingdom of God is really like. I want you to abandon your, your previous calling. I want you to give up these things and, and follow me. So there's all these stories. And then what Jesus is going to do over here is he's going to give this little teaching in Matthew chapter 10 where he, he sends out his 12. Mm -hmm. Right? He's going to send them out. And, and what's he sending them out to do? Do this. Mm -hmm. I've done it. I've showed you. Now it's your turn. Go, go, go do it. So we get this little section in Matthew 10 where he, he sends out the, the 12. Then in Matthew uh, 11 through 13, we get this whole little section um, that's going to be kind of focused on how, how do people respond to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he gives some, some different stories. Uh, there are some people that they, they respond positively, right? They, they accept that Jesus is the Messiah. They think it's really cool that, that Jesus has done this. It's awesome. Um, that's really nice. Uh, you get some people that they're pretty neutral, you know. He's entertaining. We'll listen to him teach a couple times. You know, it's not boring. That's, that's at least something. But they're kind of neutral. They're not ready to give, give up their entire lives. They're just kind of on the fence there. Uh, and then you get some people that their response is just totally negative. Who are these people? The Pharisees. The Pharisees, yeah. right? Why are they negative? Because he's bucking the system. Jesus is challenging their power. Yeah. <laughs> like... He is coming in and saying, I'm giving you a new way to live life. Well, guess who controls the way everyone's supposed to live life in Jerusalem? Pharisees. The Pharisees control this. So Jesus is directly attacking their power. And come on, we're all human. What happens when someone challenges our power? We get mad. We get mad. Like, we don't like that. We get upset. We get frustrated. We fight back. It's a very human book. Matthew is not just... There's so much here with, with all of that. So then what Jesus is going to do is, seeing all these different responses, this is where Jesus is going to give the parables, or, or a set of parables. There's other ones in this. And these parables are going to have to do with 
some people will respond positively and some people will not. And so what is a key parable about people responding to God positively, negatively? It's like the most famous parable of all. Forgive 77 times. Or 70 times. Okay. That's there. It's not the parable I'm thinking of, but it's there. This is the one she was talking about. It's all of the talents. No, nope, not that one. Sow and seed. Sow and seed. Yeah, sow and seed. Right? Because what's the whole point of that parable? A farmer goes out and sows seed, and, and for some of them, they grow up and they're healthy, and some of them don't grow at all, and some of them grow and they get choked out. He's, he's doing this exact thing. He's saying, look, you guys have already seen it. Some people really respond to this. Some people aren't all that interested. Some people negatively respond. He's just connecting it all up together and you know, all this other stuff. So he's going to give these, these parables about it. Then in 14 through 20, we, we get these stories that are more focused on uh, like expectations of what the Messiah is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So this is what you were talking about earlier, Travis. Um, so this, dude, that's horrible handwriting. That, like, that makes no sense. Whatever. Um, look, let me just be honest. Go and Google the Bible Project Matthew, and you will find like an actual that has really cool drawings and really pretty characters, and it makes a lot more sense. This is just just overview and interactive a little bit more here. Um, so, so there's these expectations of Messiah. So we get stories where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And there's another story that's pretty similar to that one. And there's all these different stories about what, what people are expecting from the Messiah. What do the Pharisees expect of this Messiah that's been promised in the Old Testament? They expect Rambo Jesus. That's the way my professor said it when I was in college. I've stolen it from him forever. They expect Jesus to come out with a machine gun, way lay down the Roman Empire, establish the throne of David, conquer the world. What does Jesus do? Not, not that. Yeah. Not that. Here, here's the crazy thing, though. It's not just the Pharisees, because this is the point in Matthew's Gospel that, that Jesus is going to ask his disciples, who do people say that I am? Right? And Peter's going to say, well, some say that you're Elijah, and some say that you're a prophet. And Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And what does Matthew say? You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Yeah, you're the Christ. Peter gets it, and then right after that, Peter's like, and now it's time to go take on the world. Like, let's, <laughs> let's, <laughs> now where's my machine gun? Now where's my machine gun? Let's, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. This is the only time like a Roman was attacked in front of Jesus and put his ear back on. Like, yeah, yeah, and who was it that attacked the Roman in front of Jesus? Actually, it's one of the high priests, but still. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. It's Peter. Yeah. Yeah, someone that was an enemy. Of, of this. Yeah, it was Peter. Yeah. Um, and so, so what Jesus is going to go in here is he's going to go into this teaching about the, the upside down kingdom. That this whole thing he's doing is totally different than what anyone expects. So rather than, than conquering the world, Jesus is going to be conquered by the world. He's going to lay down his life. And we're like, what? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to us. And, and Matthew kind of just lets that hang there for a little bit. Because he's going he's gonna to build into it a little bit more. And then we get into 21 through 25. And this is where things are, are starting to clash more and more and more. Because in 21, he rides in on Palm Sunday. People are crying, Hosanna. It's this great, wonderful time. Jesus gets into the, the town, to Jerusalem. What's the first thing he goes and does? He starts flipping tables. Mm-hmm. So... Which I think, like, any pastor would be like, I wish I could do that sometime. Like, not, not even because I'm, like, mad. I just, like, think it would be fun, you know? I don't know. Right? But when Jesus comes in, he starts flipping tables. Guess how the Pharisees respond to this? Not well. They're, this is the point that the Pharisees come into the book of Matthew and say, we're not just going to try to argue with this guy anymore. It's time to kill him. We're going to kill this guy. Yeah. Um, they, they do try to argue with him a little bit here, and he just puts them in their place over and over and over again. So finally they decide to kill him. Jesus gives this kind of final final sermon type thing where he, he's going to critique them. And this is the, the famous, you brood of vipers. You, he just lays in to, to the Pharisees here. Um, and then he, he gets away, he gets out of town, and he gives like a final teaching to his disciples. And it's this whole thing that's going to launch us then into Passover week, right? So, so 26 is going to start us off with, with Passover, which, oh, by the way, what, what, is, what is Passover a reference to? The angel of death passing out with the blood in there. It's tied to Moses. And, and yeah. A literal passing over. A literally passing over. And, and how, how are the people in Israel passed over? By the death of a lamb. Mm-hmm. By a sacrifice. Yeah. 
So Jesus has come in, he has this Passover meal, and he takes the blood and the lamb and the bread, and he, he separates it all up and he redefines it all. So, so this blood is, is not the blood of the lamb that's sacrificed, but whose blood? blood. This is my blood. And this bread is not the body of a lamb, or this is my, my body. And then he comes in and says, this is the new covenant. I'm, I'm doing something pretty, pretty exceptional here. And then from there, they go to the garden, and he gets arrested and tried. There's so much to this, and we'll, we'll get into it, you know, like seven years. I don't know how long it'll take, but... <laughs> <laughs> arrested, and there's this, this trial... Um, which that, that leads to the crucifixion. And again, Matthew kind of hits this whole, just quoting Old Testament here. I'll, just, I'll put cross right here. That'll be good. Matthew just goes into quoting Old Testament scriptures. And he's just saying, this was said to fulfill this, and this happened to fulfill this. And this was, he, he's just drawing, drawing it all in and making these connections. Um, and, and then after Jesus' death and burial, the story ends. No, there's, there's resurrection. So Jesus resurrects, and in Matthew 28, he has one final discussion with his disciples in, in Matthew's gospel. And, and his big final command to the disciples is going to be what we call the Great Commission. Great commission right? And so, so therefore, go into all nations, baptizing them. Oh, have baptized been mentioned before in this book? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Pass them through the waters from death to life. Right, go go baptize them uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do what? My follow, follow my instructions, mm -hmm. te teaching them to, to obey me. Mm -hmm. Have we heard any you know like follow me references in this book or instructions mm -hmm. from Jesus? Mm -hmm. Like, uh -oh, I, gotta, I drew my arrow wrong. Yeah, like uh, all over the place here, some here, some here, some here. So I'm here, and then he gives this final for, if you're a good King James version, for lo, I am with you. Oh, by the way, what does Emmanuel mean? With you. So what does what does Matthew do? He, he just tied everything back in. This is what Jesus says. Man, like I get chill bumps thinking about this. <laughs> like the sheer poetry of what Matt. It's so easy for people to like take the take the Bible like that's a that's a book of myths from it's just an old book. And I'm like, really, dude? Like I'm telling you, there is nothing modern that's been written anywhere near as eloquently as this. Um, it makes you wonder if this was written 30 years after the fact. Imagine how well spoken Jesus must have been. Yeah. At the time. Yeah. You know, like what the impact that he makes and, and the change that he gets inside of people and yeah, because. Matthew's a tax collector, granted, but what, what are the most of the other of his disciples? Fishermen. They're fishermen. They're not scholars. They're not smart guys. Mm -hmm. This is your ranch workers. And they're just like, let's go. You know? <laughs> and they're totally just changing the world. This is Acts, right? Who are these men that are flipping the world upside down? These uneducated men. Um, and it's all because they, they've experienced with Jesus. Okay, so let me go back now and talk a little bit more about chapters 1 through 3. What time is it now? 1910. Dude, I don't know what that means. <laughs> ten after seven. Okay. I got enough time to. You, how you guys doing? Sorry, I should. I'm just kind of running here. Um, okay. Good deal. By the way, we won't be drawing all this stuff out next. There'll come a time that we'll do a little bit more of just going into and actually like reading the verses, and, and we'll do that some today. But, uh, but yeah. So, uh, so we remember Messiah from the line of David. Teacher in the way of Moses, Emmanuel, God, God with us. It's it's all being tied tied together here. But Matthew chapter one, we start out with a. It's everyone's favorite part to read out of the Bible, right? A genealogy, mm -hmm. and every time you start in the book of Matthew, you say, "Okay, I don't have to read the first half of this chapter." Start in the because <laughs> there's a bunch of names, right? Like. Uh... Yeah, is, they were important. That's why you put them in there. Exactly. You're right. Is, is there a reason behind these names? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely is. Um, this is very generic. And, and we'll, test. Yeah. Wow. This is very generic. So I'm not going to go into all of that right now, though. I think there's some of it. But but he starts off. It, it's a connection to the Old Testament, mm -hmm. particularly to two two people in the Old Testament. Who, who are they? David and Abraham. David and Abraham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's going to take. 
Jesus, connect Jesus to David, connect David to Abraham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's going to give these genealogies. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Then right from there, he then transfers the narrative to the, the birth story. This is usually really Luke at Christmas, but if you really want to talk about the wise men, you have to go to Matthew. So uh, he goes into the birth narrative, and man, there are just like all these references to Old Testament stories in, in this. So he's going to talk about the reference of uh, that, that the nations would come to him, right? Isaiah 60. Um, so he's going to talk about nations. How, how are the nations going to come to Jesus? As a little baby infant. Three kids. Three wise men, yeah, right? The, the um, like astrologist, is that the right term? Not, I don't want to be like Zodiac signs, I don't care about that, that's stupid. Um, when people that look at the stars, is that astrologist? Astronomers. 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 Thank you. Astronomers. I should know that. Astronomers. 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 I, should, I should know that, yeah. But they got their star maps out. They're just looking. They see something in the sky that says there's a king. And they're like, we're going to go find him. Yeah. So, and, and where are they from? Are they Jewish? No. No, they're not Jewish. They're from the east. They're, they're nations out there somewhere that are coming to see this, this new king. Um, yeah, so so that's a prediction of... A prediction. It's not a prediction. It's a prophecy. I should not entertangle those two words. Um, and, and there's you know one, one about Bethlehem, right? From, you, you know the book, Micah? You get one guess. <laughs> you, know, you, you know the book, Micah. Oh, yeah. 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 The, the prediction of, of Bethlehem from, from you of Bethlehem, a child. Uh, yeah. you, guys, you guys know the story, about, uh, Micah chapter five, um, the the virgin birth, right? That that's in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. There's all this stuff. Um, there's just prophecy after prophecy that's being fulfilled. Um, and then outside of that, then you get the whole fleeing to Egypt. There's a whole conversation to be had there. And again, he's rooting all that in the Old Testament prophecy. And welcome to the book of Matthew, right? It's just all over the place, and it's glorious and good and fun. And yeah, let's let's read the first verse and see where we go from there. You guys have any questions? All right, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, son of Abraham. And I, I'm sorry, but I, we have to do this already. Uh, we got to play with Greek some because it's important and it matters. And you'll, you'll know it. Uh, <laughs> you, you, the word genealogy in... Uh, my Bible will stay open. That's fine. Uh, here. <laughs> Let me leave this up here. Let me see it. Where, the word genealogy in Greek is the word... Uh, Genesis, right? Genesis. Genesis. You ever heard that word? Genesis, yeah, it's Genesis. Why would Matthew want one of the first words in his gospel to be the word Genesis? Because he's tying us back to the Old Testament. He's saying, here's the Genesis of Jesus, right? Here's the beginning of, of what God is already doing. Oh, by the way, when did this whole story start? In the beginning, Genesis. Yeah, he's tying us back in. Here, here's another weird thing, though. Um, if you go down to verse 18, in verse 18, he says, the birth of Jesus Christ came about in this way. You want to know what the Greek word for birth is in Genesis 18? <laughs> it's Genesis. He says, you know, this is the Genesis of Jesus Christ, and he gives the gene genealogy. And then he says, this is the Genesis of Jesus Christ, and he gives the story. Which one is the genesis, or the genesis, of Jesus? It all is. <laughs> He's just tying it all in. He's wanting us to, to understand. So why do they translate it birth in chapter 18, or verse 18? Because it's a physical birth. Yeah. Welcome to Bible prophecy, or Bible translations. You know, like, I'm so glad that there are people out there way smarter than me that know how to do this, because <laughs> I would go cross-eyed. Yeah, because they're putting it in context, and they're saying, well, this one's a genealogy, so we can translate it genealogy, and this one's a birth narrative, so we can translate it birth, but they both are pointing us to the start uh, of. So, so the question is, what's, what's this whole point? And, and I think the point is not, this is not just the birth narrative of Jesus, and this is not just the genealogy of Jesus, this is the whole story. That's coming to, to, to a climax in this baby that's being born. 
everything that you know if you're Jewish is, is leading up to this man. And everything that you don't know if, if you're not Jewish, every answer to why are we here, what's the purpose of life, why is there evil, what, it is all resolved with and answered in Jesus. So we're starting this off with, with this whole thing. So where, where do we start with this? The beginning, right? And so this is exactly what he does. He, he's going to start us off with, with Abraham. So quick question. Um, Mark, uh, no, is it Mark? Mark starts us off with Adam. Mark or Luke? I, believe, I think it's Mark. Starts us off with Adam. Um, why, why does Matthew start us off with Abraham? Yeah, tell me, is it Mark or Luke? I'm sorry, I should know these things. This is why I, I ask all these questions, and I'm really cheating because I do the study beforehand and then don't know everything. No, it must be Luke. Is it Luke? Luke is okay, it's, not Mark. it's Luke. Yeah. Uh, Mark's a really short gospel. I should have known that. It's all right. Um, so why, why, does, why does Matthew start with Abraham and not Adam? I, I, I'm doing a little bit of, you know, just interpretation right here. It's not like I have a commentary that Matthew appeared to me in a dream and said, this is why I started with Abraham. And, um, I, I think, because he even points this out, in, in this genealogy, you have uh, three, three sets of 14, right? Mm -hmm. So he, he's doing three key things. And so each, each one of these is trying to point something out to us. You kind of have to tune yourself to it. Mm -hmm. and, and the other side of it, too, is, He's already, tying, he's already soon to tie us back to Genesis 1 when he's going to give the birth story of Jesus because how does Jesus come into existence as a man? The, the, the tie-in of the Holy Spirit and the virgin womb, right? This is our, and so how does God create life in Genesis 1? The Holy Spirit hovering over the deep. Like, it's the Spirit bringing life into a place that otherwise should not be able to sustain or create life. So he's already going to match us up to Genesis chapter 1. He's, he's got that in store. So he's saying, I can make that connection there. For here, let's focus on Abraham. That's my own interpretation, but there, there, there it is. So he starts off uh, with, with this kind of first section, and he's going to go Abraham to David. Um, let, me, let me just kind of give you this, and I'll give you my general thoughts then we'll start a conversation about what I think is going on here, and then we'll probably have to end it there for, for the night. Um, so, so Abraham to David. The second one is, is Solomon to exile. And then the final one is post-exile. Now I'm down here, so I'm writing like this. To, to Jesus, right? So... Um, here, we'll, we'll go backwards. What all is going on post-exile to Jesus? The silence is probably the right answer. Because we really don't know. You know the, the Old Testament is not speaking much here. Um, the Old Testament it gives a little bit about like Nehemiah and coming back and building the walls. But for the most part, it's pretty silent. There, there's not prophets. There's, not, uh, there's just silence. And so I think right here, when he's giving these names... It's funny, if you go through, and, and after the exile to Babylon, Jeconah, fathered Sheathiel, Sheathiel, Zerubbabel. Mm -hmm. Like, we know, we know Zerubbabel, but by the way, uh, again, I think I've talked about this before. Z Zerubbabel is, is Hebrew. You guys know what the word Zeru means in Hebrew? It's, it's born. Oh, born in Babylon. <laughs> yeah, and then Babel, Babel. So, so where was Zerubbabel born? Babylon. Yeah. Born in Babylon. Why was he born in Babylon? Because they were exiled. That's where he was. That's where he was. Yeah. <laughs> there was no Jerusalem at this point. So, but but it's going to go down, and there's going to be names that we don't even find in the Old Testament. It's just a lot of silence. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what what Matthew's saying is, even when things seem silent, God was still at work. He, he was continuing this genealogy. He was raising up people. Right. So it's this idea that even if we don't see it, there's there's hope. Um, and there, there's more to talk about there, but that's just a very generic thing. Um, the time between Solomon and exile. How good of a time is this in Israel's history? It's terrible. It's like worst of the worst time. You just got split kingdoms, division, bad king after bad king after bad king after bad king. Every so often you get like a glimpse of a good king, and it's not long until he loses it all and it goes into bad. Yeah, just bad, bad king. Think, things are chaotic and, and bad and not, not great. And 
does God ever say, I'm done with you, Israel. I don't want to deal with you anymore. No, but even through these names of, of evil kings, like God, God is faithful. That God's faithfulness remains even when we just see the world as terrible. Hold on to that, because that's going to come out really clearly in Matthew chapter 2. Because I was, I was thinking about this, too. I get ahead of myself with stuff like this, but like, you know, we're really good at the Christmas story at like doing everything and then cutting it right at the point that King Herod announces, like, let's kill all the babies. Because that's not a fun thing to think about at Christmas time. Like, we don't we don't like that part of the story at all. So we're just we'll tell our Christmas narrative and leave that out. But like, uh, put yourself in Mary's shoes for a little bit, right? Like, imagine you go to Bethlehem, you have a baby, an angel appears to you and says, or appears to Joseph and says, "Get out!" Herod and Roman soldiers are on their way, and you head out. You get to to Egypt, and you get word that Herod has killed every single boy in Bethlehem, two and younger. You think you're going to carry some guilt with you? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I think you have to. And all of a sudden, like, what's the first thing that the, the angel tells Mary when he's telling, when Gabriel's telling her that she's going to get pregnant? Like, you are blessed among women. Thanks, God. I really feel blessed right now. There's a bunch of dead babies that mm -hmm. I feel like is my fault. Mm -hmm. Like, is God faithful even when things are hard? Yes. I think that's what Matthew 2 is, is trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, but then right here, uh, a Abraham through, through David, this, this is a really fun part. Uh, I mean, this, this part is beautiful. Because if you're trying to give a genealogy, what time is it? 7.24. 724. Okay, five minutes. I can get through. Um, if you're if you're trying to give a genealogy, why are you giving a genealogy? We, we in modern America really don't keep super great track of genealogies, right? Um, but if you lived in a mon monarchy, you really would keep track of genealogies mm -hmm. because what are you trying to prove? Yeah. I got royalty in my bloodline, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a big thing, because because I'm an heir to, and this is, you know. Arguments and, and wars fought throughout medieval England for centuries of, I have the rights to this one. No, I have the rights to this one. Well, here's my bloodline. Well, here's my bloodline. And, you know, whatever. So when you're given a genealogy, you're going to try to pick out the most significant people, the most important people, and the most... Do you know the types of people that Matthew selects for Jesus' genealogy in this? Because this isn't... There's a more names, right? This isn't it. He picks names that you should never add. Because particularly in this mm -hmm. part, there, there's four women. Yeah. And that's, you know, that world 101, if you're trying to prove your significance through a genealogy, you don't list women. Mm -hmm. Like, if Matthew was trying to just pull the wool over our eyes and, like, hide this from us and, like, try to lie to us, he would have picked a lot more significant people. And instead, he, he picks four, four women. And there's more than this, too, in this. But, but these four women, mm -hmm. uh, do you know how, how good their lives are? Dude, it is scandalous. Mm -hmm. Like, when's the last time you went and read Genesis 38 and the story of Tamar? Well, that's pretty gross. Uh, I'll give you a PG, like, thir 13 version of it. Um, Judah's son marries Tamar. His son dies. So she has to go to, um, to, to his brother. And his brother doesn't, uh, we'll say, take care of her the way he's supposed to. And so God strikes his brother down. And so Judah decides that he doesn't want to give her his other son because... Some relationship with this woman, my sons keep dying. And so he kind of denies her that. So she eventually dresses up as a harlot and tricks Judah into making a baby with, with her. Yeah. And uh, whew, like, this is where it's like telling your kids, like, read the Bible, but also. No. Not that chapter. Not that chapter, you know. Yeah. It's, it's scandalous, right? Why does Matthew put this in the gospel? Does Matthew not, is Matthew not aware that it's scandalous? Because it's real life. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to make a commentary on this. He's saying, hey, even when there's these women with, with scandalous backgrounds and darkness and things that, what, what is God doing? He's giving mercy and working through it and entertangled in it and loving, like God is involved with, with Tamar in all this, even though there's, there's scandal. And then he goes on to, to Rahab. And, and what's Rahab's whole occupation? Prostitute. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, these four women, none of them are Israelites. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, all foreigners. Ruth is like the best one. Mm -hmm. All right, she, she's got a little bit going for her there. But Bathsheba in herself, but there's some story. But but Ruth, it, it seems to be the best one. Ruth is a Moabite. You guys know how the Moabites came to be? You remember that story with Lot and his daughters? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's where Moab comes from. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a whole story there. If you don't, 
Um, Lot's daughters get him drunk and decide that they'll start their own family that way. Um, and <laughs> welcome to Genesis, you know? Is it trying to hide itself from us? God is very aware that we as humanity are messed up and we will give in our own accord, just mess this world up left and right. And what does God do through it? Mercy and grace. And he just keeps using these people. And he, he doesn't even name Bathsheba. Instead, he comes in, uh, let's see, David, Sol uh, David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. <laughs> he, he doesn't even name her. Do you think Matthew's doing that by accident? No. Why does he call Bathsheba Uriah's wife? Because she was. Because he sees the scandal there. He says, let's just, let's just remember so how many how many blemishes are on Jesus's family tree? Quite a lot. Yeah. And how many blemishes are on my family tree? And how many blemishes are on your family tree? And how, like, yeah. this is humanity. We know it's humanity. I'm just saying, like, if Matthew made this thing up, I could have done a lot better job of coming up with a way of doing this to make it seem a lot better. But Matthew's not interested in making this seem good. He's interested in telling you what God has been doing from the beginning of time until now, and why Jesus is the fulfillment of it all, right? So there, we, we got through six verses tonight in, in a roundabout way. You guys have any, anything else you want to add to it? I always feel like when I get done, it's just like the ramblings of a madman. <laughs> I'm just going to say here, the, the, the correlation between Jesus and Moses, uh -huh. out of Egypt, yeah. uh -huh. there's also a column of twelve. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And where did where did you get the number twelve from? Yeah, the twelve. I didn't. I, I meant to mention this too. How how many chunks of stories are there? Five. Five. How many books are there in the Torah? Five. Five. Yeah. Just Moses's instructions. Yeah. Jesus's stories and instructions. Lots of. Yeah. Matthew's lining it all up. It's, it's cool stuff. So let me let me pray for us. God, thank you for just your goodness. Thank you for the beauty of Scripture. It is amazing. Uh, let us become more amazed by it daily. Let us fall in love with it. And in the process, let us fall deeper in love with you. Thank you for letting us do all that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, guys. Um, next, next week.